Thank you so much, Adrian, um, for helping coordinate this. We're really excited to chat with you guys today. Um, we'll do a quick intro. Um, so my name's Lanning. I'm business development and uh, partnerships lead at Rodeo. Um, my background's in brand operations, working um, with Rodeo for about three years now with a multitude of different brands and clients um, in the past few years. And before that was with HLI Snacks through their acquisition to Campbell's um, Soup Company and then working for a direct-to-consumer almond milk company. Um, Kevin, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Kevin Mannering. Uh, I've been with Rodeo since 2019. And prior to that, I was, a, I was a happy resident of Boulder, Colorado. And before that, Sunnyside, Queens, so ties to the the New York area. Um, at, at that time, I was working uh, as the second employee at a company called Quinn Popcorn, which has developed into a, a very successful business. Been Quinn Snacks, now grain-free pretzels, as well as the cleaned up microwave popcorn that I worked on. Uh, in 2015, I, I joined the dark side and went to work for a sales agency. Uh, ended up getting very interested in the financial back end of, of brands and how brands were making things work uh, and staying in business on such thin margins with such high deductions coming from the, the retailers and distributors they were working with. So I started an independent consulting business that I merged into Rodeo um, and have been working uh, within Rodeo on our sales products, uh, selling into uh, retail stores as well as some technology solutions that we use behind the scenes to sort of help um, identify where to focus our, our team's efforts. Awesome. So go ahead, Lenny. I was going to say, um, thank you for that introduction. And um, Kevin's going to just take us through a little overview on um, our perspective of the current retail landscape and our kind of thesis on how everything's evolving and changing, particularly for emerging brands um, in the CPG space. Cool. Um, yeah. So I think one of the, the most interesting things, this is this being naturally New York, is that better for you brands uh, that, I mean, they've been having a moment for about 15 years at this point. Uh, and there, that shows no sign of slowing down. Uh, you know, McKinsey did a, a very in-depth report um, at the beginning of the year on the on the future of grocery and what was driving uh, the the growth in the in the grocery industry, which is near nearing a trillion dollars um, annually. And really, it's better for you, and that's premium better for you brands as well as store brands ad ad adopting sort of. You know, if you go into some of an Albertsons own store, you'll see. Uh, the line, new lines of organic signature select products. So understanding that these, this is not just a uh, high income sort of novelty uh, play anymore. This is big business and it's driven by demographic changes. Millennial and Gen Z shoppers um, are always looking for better for you products. Obviously cost is still a concern. So those low cost options have grabbed a lot of market share. Um, but what's really being squeezed right now are really mainline conventional brands. Um, same store sales growth has been very tough uh, for them to see as, as premium products come in competing on the high end and store brand products come in competing on the low end, making better for you claims. Um, the other thing that's, that's really positive in our outlook for better for you brands, even with all the negative uh, economic news that we, we see is that if you go back to the 2008, 2009 recession, there was there was a blip in our sort of 10% year over year growth in the natural products industry. It went down to 6% while the economy was contracting as a whole. So it is it is a it is about the strongest trend uh, I think you would see of of, of continued growth um, through through hard economic times in terms of uh, major industries. Um, so landing, if you want to go in there, there is a problem though, with all of this growth, uh, it's put a strain on the infrastructure that was in place back when I started if brokers were, uh, were dominant, but there weren't these sort of additional sales agencies and there were very few sort of outsourced merchandising companies, um, data and ana uh, analysis was sort of in-house at, at, uh, presence marketing when we worked with them from 2012 to about 2014 at Quinn. Um, now, still that, 
in a lot of different brokers, but they're going to charge extra for it. And in terms of the in-store support, the field staffs of distributors have been cut and of large-scale brokers quite a bit. So now if you want support with resets, you want your brand sort of represented in the store, there's there's a whole new cottage industry of third-party merchandisers from sort of tech-enabled uh, Uber-like models like uh, Sur Survey.com, which is now owned by Trax, I believe it's called Trax Dynamic Merchandising, um, or Observa, and then sort of internal uh, or sort of agency-based uh, merchandisers like like Dirty Hands or Base Makers or, or, or folks like that. Uh, that you, that you can hire to go on a, a route, but that is really what you need to do to get any sort of in-store support. Um, so that declining service level has really, you see our, our little cartoon guy, he's looking really, really depressed with the number of brands that he has to represent. And, and uh, uh, the, the other point I wanted to make on, on the brokers and distributors is, is really more focused on the distributors. You saw UNFI acquire super value several years ago. And what they've needed to do, I mean, they're a percentage of sales basis. They have a lot of uh, sunk cost in terms of infrastructure. UNFI in particular has a lot of sunk cost in servicing the debt from that super value acquisition. So what they need to do is broaden who they go to. Uh, so you see UNFI and you see the sort of formerly natural focus brokers expanding, expanding, expanding into every conventional retailer um, every conventional retailer there is. And then sort of newer in, I'd say FAIR was launched in 2017, I believe. And that's probably made one of the biggest impacts um, in terms of wholesale marketplaces. Mabel came shortly thereafter, uh, if memory serves. But there's, there's these new options for selling wholesale uh, direct to different retailers, sort of bypassing the old broker and, and distributor model. Um, there's also a lot of SaaS tools for doing uh, mainly like things like forecasting or data analysis. Uh, but I, I think one of the problems with with these things that have come with these things that have come up, number one, adoption between the the retailers and the wholesale platforms, uh, and and number two, sort of a lack of sales enablement uh, tools to sort of help brands introduce themselves to these retailers and sort of break through the noise of all the brands that are on the marketplace. So I think there's there's sort of a gap there where these wholesale platforms are doing quite well themselves with the number of brands that they have. But but again, that it is hard for brands to to break through and gather a lot of customers uh, for these retailers. Uh, and then finally, the, the other part, point on on the software as a service tools, I think a lot of them are, are struggling right now um, because it is or adding sort of service on top of their tools. Because a lot of these tools require in-depth knowledge of the of the sort of grocery CPG industry, um, you know, knowledge of the acronyms, knowledge of what the inputs should be, all, all of that sort of stuff. And the vast majority of brands that are sort of under 10 million uh, in sales, which which is the vast majority of brands and, and potential customers for these these SaaS tools out there, are. Uh, entrepreneurs or entrepreneurial led teams without significant grocery CPG experience. We have a, a very sort of interesting industry here in, in the natural products industry where a lot of people come into it from other places, which is terrific. But if you build a very complex tool from you know, your years of experience, it's very hard for, for inexperienced operators to run, uh, to run those tools. Um, so that that's, uh, to, and to run them properly. So I think there's there's definitely change on the horizon um, and uh, sort of light at the end of the tunnel, but there's a lot of gaps, I think, uh, in the marketplace in order to get there. Um, and I'd love when we get to Q&A to, to answer questions on this because I've been, I've looked at almost every, I, I want to think I've looked at almost every tool and marketplace that there is out there. So if there are specific questions on those. Um, I We do have a philosophy of trying to help these these types of companies fill those fill those gaps. But our, our, our thesis looking at at sort of all of this is that intelligent retail partner focus is critical if you're an emerging better for you brand trying to sell in grocery. And, and that's true for for several different reasons. 
as we talked about the distributors and brokers, brokers sort of broadening their focus while also cutting service levels, it means that execution rates on shelf have, have become very tough. Uh, I did a poll on LinkedIn recently uh, asking folks how their UNFI and KE fill rates were across the country. And many, the vast majority were saying below 90%. You know, that's stores have ordered our product, but the distributor didn't have it. Uh, in inventory to fill it at that particular DC at that particular time. That then leads to out of stocks on shelf. And that then leads to, you know, if you're approved in 100 Whole Foods and that's most of your business, you got an 80% fill rate, maybe you're now in, in 80, not, and you've lost 20% of your business. So you really do need to be pinpoint accurate in terms of the intelligent retail part in terms of the retail partners that that you focus if, if you're going to go after sort of conventional chains that are in your region i think you, you better have a plan for how you're going to help support the execution um, at shelf because one of the things we didn't talk about too much uh at the beginning that's true and, and that was mentioned in that mckinsey report that i recommend everyone go read is uh, is that stores are focused more and more on automating in-store personnel. Uh, so in that, uh, in that report, McKinsey estimates that 52% of in-store retail support is going to be automated by the year 2030. And what that means is that if you don't have, if you're sort of not in the system uh, and your people sort of aren't going into the stores on, on your behalf, you're going to lose more and more shelf space in, in sort of the new world. Um, and, and access to shelf is becoming more and more expensive. Just getting that approval, uh, you know, we see a lot of these retailers who are maybe don't execute quite as well with natural products, increasing their uh, increasing increasing their slotting ass, particularly in the conventional space. And 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 a lot of that is because the other growing area is the, is these store brands, and that's probably going to accelerate during the recession as more and more shoppers start to sort of self-select down to private label organic products. So I, I think of a, of a re, not to pick on anybody, but I think of a retailer like Shaw's here in the, in the Northeast, it's gonna be very, very difficult to succeed there um, as, a, as a better for you brands in, um, you know, in, in the coming years without a lot of infrastructure behind it um, to, to ensure success. The other thing is there's not, an, there's not an unlimited well of investment dollars. The private markets have seized up in recent months, I would say. I mean, really around May it started and accelerated by September. That number of VC deals um, in, in this space has gone, in almost every space, has, has really plummeted. Um, now, that's probably temporary, but the market was extremely overheated after years and years of low interest rates, as I'm sure everyone has read about. So I do think that the trend, and, and we do think at Rodeo, that the trend will be towards preserving margin uh, more. And, and that if there, as venture capital sort of com, comes back in, is this, is this brand sort of default alive? Like if they stop their R&D spending, they stop you know, new slotting spending, you know, are they making money? Um, and and could they survive sort of the, that that uh, that place? And I think that's that's kind of the what I'm hearing sort of from DCs in the space that that's become something that they're very interested in. And if you're spending a lot on infrastructure just to keep your product on the shelf and losing money at at a bunch of conventional retailers that uh, that are not executing very well, then you're not going to be default alive. Um, I think that's it for, for this slide landing, if you want to continue on. Yeah, so that's why, you know, the focus we really think should be for a brand. So I don't know if there's any people who are thinking about starting a brand or in the very early stages um, of, uh, of growing their brand. But really, we look at it as three different sectors um, of grocery right now. Number one is just reminding everyone that the natural independent grocery channel even though it is notoriously hard to, to penetrate and manage because it's not, uh, you know, it's not one chain with hundreds of stores. It is a, it, it is one that you can access via some new wholesale marketplaces like Fair, Pod Foods, and Mabel. 
Um, and it is a $20 billion industry uh, annually. They do 20 billion in sales in that nat natural independent grocery channel. And, it's, and that actually exceeds the amount done in the uh, national, especially supermarket channel, which is obviously led by Whole Foods and, and increasingly Sprouts. Um, the other, the other mar uh, people we put in that bucket too of naturally and specially focused supermarkets um, are these sort of alternative outlets, delivery services, um, you know, two, two accounts that we've seen a lot of uh, success at recently are Foxtrot uh, and GoPuff, as well as, uh, as well as Fresh Direct, which I would, I would put, you know, in this, uh, in this category. And then, and then, and, and sort of only then, uh, I would say the select conventional chains that are on the cutting edge of sort of omni-channel adoption, because that, that is another thing that, um, that premium shoppers have, have reported using quite a bit is that they're going sort of online to either build their gr uh, grocery lists to discover new products and then go buy them at the store or to do cur curbside pickup, that, that sort of thing. Um, if, so I've got some examples of, of retailers here that are really investing tons and tons of money on omni-channel adoption that have very vendor-friendly policies. So for example, you're not going to get charged slotting at, at Publix. Wegmans is an everyday low price retailer. So you, you're not going to have to go through the rigmarole of, of, of high, low promotions and be pushed into buy one, get one freeze and things like that to increase your velocity. It's either you're in and you're selling uh, or, or you're not. Uh, folks like Kroger are making huge investments in home delivery. So being you know, slotted with with Kroger in a particular place. You know, assuming that you've gained a lot of brand traction in, in sectors one and two, uh, I think that's a place where velocities can increase quite a bit. Uh, there, there there are slotting asks at Kroger, but I think there are exceptions for minority and women-owned businesses, and um, they do have a lot of they do have a lot of vendor-friendly policies that you wouldn't find at you know some of your uh, some of your you know other of some of their competitors. So, you know, this all comes back to, and I'll turn it over to Lanning to talk about sort of what we do at Rodeo to help brands um, in this space, uh, you know, in, in, a, in the next slide. But in terms of sort of the pillars for emerging brands, I think it's really important to prepare, um, you know, before launching your 2023 sales plan do the research on on the accounts that you're targeting, understands, uh, you know, whether it's talking to your broker, talking to a consultant, talking to other founders in the industry, the free option, that's always a good one, uh, about sort of what their experience was in terms of velocity at a particular account, what they, they paid in slotting, um, and sort of understand, and, and then do your own research, uh, you know, uh, online, look at, look up sort of articles around, if you're, particularly if you're going uh, for conventional retailers, particularly if they're publicly traded, uh, you can get some very good information about sort of where their focus uh, is in terms of growth. Uh, and if it's not on better for you premium brands, you know, via or, or sort of growing the premium share, uh, growing their, their share of the premium market, uh, if you don't see sort of those keywords, then you can sort of read into that that they're going to be focused a lot on on private label and a lot less on 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 the sector of products that that we're that we're talking about um so that's really important getting on the shelf in these places is obviously extremely important and managing your sales infrastructure to stay on the shelf um so understanding what infrastructure you need to have in place um for each particular sort of region or, or retailer that you're going into is, is really important in planning out, obviously, the financing uh, of that and making sure it works with your, um, with, with your margins. So uh, actually, this is, the last, this is the last slide that I'll talk to, and then Lanning will jump in to talk about what we do at Rodeo. But I, you know, for, for folks who haven't been in the industry for too long that might be on this call listening to this webinar, I thought it would, it would be useful to insert this one to just sort of lay out like what is the difference between brokers, third party merchandisers, and then those distributor reps who can sometimes sometimes reach out and say, hey, I've got an opportunity for you at Brookshire Brothers or something like that. 
So the way that the way that we see it is that brokers you know, tend to focus on a particular channel, whether it's grocery or mass or food service, and work and or and, and then there's some still regionally, although there's been a lot of consolidation of regional brokers in recent years. And they work on a commission or retainer, normally like whatever is greater, starting at, a, at about 5% um, of sales, at least in the grocery channel. Um, what they really do is act as relationship managers between the retailer and, and distributor partners they have. Remember that the, if there's one thing to take away on brokers you know, that I would like to get across, it's that their relationship with the retailer and distributor is paramount. Um, they don't have a business without that relationship. So you can utilize them, but expecting them to go to bat to make a, a bunch of exceptions to the retailer's policies for your one particular brand out of the, you know, either tens or hundreds that they represent is asking them to do something that's against their core business model. Maybe it'll happen once or twice uh, and that would be really beneficial for you, but really it is, it is the role of, of you and your sales team uh, to go to bat for, for your brands um, in, in the space. We talked about third-party merchandisers a little bit and the, and the different, uh, and the different um, companies that, that do it. You know, their impact, one thing that I would say that's interesting is impacts, their impact really does vary by category. So if you're in a low velocity category, you know, how you would utilize merchandisers definitely is, is, is different than what a beverage company would do or what a snack company would do that's looking to, you know, stack them high and watch them fly, as they say, in terms of uh, sort of uh, chips and popcorn and things like that, all, all these, case, these case stack deals that you try and do. Um, so if you're, if you're sort of in a you know, premium olive oil company, and you've got some out of stock problems, there may be ways maybe earlier in the supply chain that you could work on fixing uh, before deploying merchandisers uh, to, the store lo to the store level when you're selling you know, a unit or two per store per week. Um, it's, usually, it, it's, usually a problem, um, it's usually a problem further back than, than being stocked you know, directly on the shelf. And then finally, for distributor reps, obviously they work for the distributor. So the larger the customer you are for the distributor, the more influence you have. Um, but normally they're not going to fill out your new item paperwork for you. The brokers will do that. Um, they may assist you, but they're not. Uh, but you know their main job is making sure that the the retailer is their the retailer is their customer. They want to make sure that the retailer gets as much of the product products that they ordered. Uh, and their focus is going to be on the sort of uh, the, the the bigger brands that are driving a lot of volume. Again, and just to illustrate, not to pick on anyone, the, the sort of the Rayos uh, pasta sauce is going to get preference over you know your brand with you know, one facing of three different SKUs when it comes to the distributor uh, when it comes to the distributor rep because they can always throw three more facings of Rayos up there, and it's probably not going to impact. The sales in the category. Um, Lanny, do you want to talk then about uh, what uh, what we do in our shameless plug? Yes. <laughs> so here's our shameless plug. Um, we are reinventing this traditional go-to-market sales agency. Um, you know everything that Kevin just spoke about. Uh, we've really tried to study the current market on on these um, you know outsourced sales agencies and try to reinvent. The structure there. Um, so by identifying the right retail partners, um, helping brands with go-to-market strategy, and then executing on that strategy, helping them, um, you know, frame up their cash flow expectations before we start executing in the retail space and, um, you know, going out to headquarter account calls, et cetera. We're also tech enabled. So we've built out a product that I'll speak to in the next slide um, to really target that $20, $20 billion independent retailer network. Um, this tool also allows you to track unit economics by the pricing calculator, really, really um, user intuitive. So I know Kevin spoke to some of the other, you know, products out there, but we're really trying to make CPG simple um, and approachable for, for founders. We also have a way to build a bottoms up sales forecast and a lot of educational components as well built in. Um, 
and we're trying to maximize your investment. So instead of hiring that internal sales director of sales, VP of sales, and an additional broker network, we're really trying to, um, you know, get you into the market, into the retail space um, by providing you a one-stop shop. So you would have access to our team of um, six sales folks who have, uh, you know, a variety of experience in, in this space. Um, and we're really trying to put your investment dollars to the growth of the, the business in the retail space. So the Pitchable app, this is our product. Um, this is what we use to target the independent retailers. It's our lead generation tool to outreach to independent retailers, um, you know, automate that process that can be really um, time intensive and confusing and, and not, you know, you're not, you're not sure who exactly to contact at each of those independent retailers. Obviously there's, there's thousands out there in, in the country. Um, we've also, oh, you know, found a way to automate some of those sales management uh, workflows that have been really tedious and time intensive, but also time sensitive. So um, facilitating orders through Unify and Kehi, as well, as well as the new wholesale platforms that Kevin spoke to, like Maple and Fair. This has the sales planner in there and then also allows you to store kind of your most up-to-date documents that are needed to manage your brand. We also have a partner marketplace um, that we've built out with over 50 vetted partners, um, everything from, you know, bookkeep, outsource bookkeeping to customer service management platforms for your, your D2C business to branding, design, et cetera. This really came out of um, my own frustration of our team getting asked, who do you guys recommend for XYZ? So we really put together, kind of curated the best um, partners in our network to offer uh, incentives and aggressive discounts for our um, clients and you know people folks in our network um, and we're happy to help connect you to the right to the right partner any questions this brings us to our Q&A we'd love to answer any questions of anything that we've chatted about um, I also wanted to call out that we have office hours for next Wednesday um, I think Adrian will be circulating a link to Calendly, um, that will be between 11.30 and uh, 3 p.m. Yes, I actually just dropped it in the chat. Okay, but perfect. will up via email as well with the presentation. Awesome. Any questions? Feel free to also shoot them over um, to us via email, or obviously you can schedule that uh, that Calendly link for um, an office hour visit. Thank you, Lanning and Kevin, for this great presentation. Would you be able to share or like demo what um, Pitchable looks like? Yes, definitely. So um, if you want to schedule time during those office hours, I'd be happy to walk you through the, the platform. Um, speak to kind of the, the nuances within that and different product features and um, be able to showcase the tool that we've really tried to target and um, build out to, to hit the independent retailers. <laughs>